The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Everyone, everyone is long since fed up with this pandemic. But as Ontario is poised to drop most of the remaining public health measures, everyone is entitled to ask, are we removing restrictions too quickly, too slowly, or just about right? We're assessing that tonight. Then, meet the Canadian-born First Lady of Iceland, Eliza Reid. She's with us on why her adopted homeland does women's equality better than just about anywhere else on Earth. It's Wednesday, March 16th, and that's next on The Agenda. Vaccine passports are no more, and shortly, mask mandates and most of the remaining public health measures to stop the spread of COVID-19 will be lifted. Is it too soon or not soon enough? With us now for more, and we introduce from furthest from our studio to closest to our studio, as is our custom. So let's start in Vancouver, British Columbia with Andre Picard, health reporter and columnist for The Globe and Mail. In Mississauga, Ontario, Sabina Vora Miller, co-founder of the South Asian Health Network and founder of the website Unambiguous Science. And here in the provincial capital, Dr. Peter Uni, scientific director of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Table and director of the Applied Health Research Centre at St. Michael's Hospital. And it's good to have you three back on TVO tonight. I want to start with a, a very simple question and get everybody on the record. Your thoughts on the province's decision to lift the mask mandates by March 21st. Andre, start us off. What do you think? I think it's reasonable to be lifting some restrictions, but the question is which ones should we be lifting and when? I, I don't think we should be uh, rushing to take our masks off. It's not a really big uh, imposition on people. It's useful. Uh, it gives us some comfort. So I, I think it's a little soon for masks. I think we should be easing out of things rather than doing everything at once. Sabina, where are you on this? I think it's far too premature to be considering removing masks right now. We still have a very high caseload. We still have under five who are not yet eligible to be vaccinated. We also don't have point of care antivirals and therapies easily available for those who are immunocompromised. You know, masks, masking is something that we can do that is easy to implement. It's very cost effective um, and it actually prevents things like future lockdowns. You know, you don't need to have things like stringent capacity limits, etc. Masking really should be one of the last things we left. So we have premature, we have a little soon. Mm -hmm. Dr. Peter Uni, where are you? I think we need more data first. That's, uh, uh, you know, the, the expected uh, response that I'm giving. But of course, that's the point right now. We start to see that uh, there's a slight increase um, in test positivity. We also see a slight increase now in our wastewater of, of a viral um, RNA. And uh, all this just points towards that we just need a little bit more data to understand. Do we just go up a tiny bit and then we stay stable again and are ready for the next step? Or will we just need uh, to wait a little bit longer? Let me follow up with you on that, Dr. Uni, because if you're saying we need more data, I infer from that that you think that the mask mandate is coming off too quickly because you'd rather have more information before making that decision. Is that fair? I believe that the decision to lift mask mandates was communicated too quickly because we didn't have the necessary data to support that. Okay, let's get uh, on the record here. This is a tweet from a virologist in Scotland who said COVID was treated like a once in a lifetime crisis until some remembered we're living in an era of pandemic threats. We can't just shut down life for years every time Hope we will carefully plan, implement, and advocate for sustainable responses with minimal disruption on daily life. Andre, could I get you to react to that? Well, I think that's true. You know, we have to have sustainable measures. Uh, who says that masks are not sustainable? We use them in all kinds of uh, uh, areas. There's, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things we use in our daily lives, uh, hairnets in restaurants, uh, uh, some masking, hard hats. Uh, we have to wear pants when we go into stores. There's all kinds of things that we do. Masks are not a great 
imposition. They're not very difficult. So yeah, we have to find sustainable measures. Uh, it's very true that we were going to to ease out of restrictions, and we're doing that. The question, you know, as I said before, I think it's when we do it and how, in what order. And masking, to me, as uh, as we heard from the other panelists, I think it's probably one of the last things we should be doing because it's easy, it's useful, and it's cost free. Let me do a quick follow up with you, though, Andre, and that is that none of the other examples that you mentioned are as fraught with political overtones and with irritation as wearing masks are for many people. Does that uh, make you reevaluate what you just said? Well, all kinds of things in life are irritating. Uh, speed limits, uh, you know, no, store closure hours. We have all kinds of rules in life that are irritating, but we try and find a, a measure that uh, most of the public can live with. And I think even if you look, look at polling, uh, the majority of people are fine with masking. Sure, it's irritating, but we are also in very unusual times. It isn't forever. Nobody's saying forever. Uh, I know that people get frustrated when we say, well, just a little bit more time because we never seem to know where the end date is, but it'll, we'll get out of this. Sabina, if March 21st, in your judgment, is too soon, can you give us a date that would make you more comfortable? You know, I think arbitrary dates absolutely make no sense. Um, I agree with Dr. Yuni that we have to be basing this on data and metrics. I mean, if you look at the way the U.S. is actually looking at removing these mask mandates, they're doing it based on criteria. So the criteria has to do with the case counts. It has to do with hospital capacity, and it has to do with how many new admissions of hospitalizations you're having daily. Now, we know hospitalizations are a lagging factor, so that's another thing we need to look at. We're not adequately testing um, in Ontario uh, for sure, but also in other parts of Canada. So we don't have a good idea what the case counts are. Um, the way I look at it is that we should be considering lifting some of these mass mandates at least two weeks out of March break, because we know that March break people are traveling. There's going to be an increased risk of transmission, especially when kids come back to schools as well. Um, we know that vaccine uptake, um, especially in the 5 to 11 age group, is abysmal at this point, and under 5 don't even have access to vaccines right now. So we need to be considering things like what is the vaccine update? What is our case count? What is uh, you know our therapy and our hospital capacity? All of that has to be considered. I, I, I'm not a fan of putting arbitrary dates. I mean, it's not as though the, you know, the virus puts in a calendar invite for one of us and says, well, you know, on this date I'm leaving. Um, so we have to do it in a very measured and very data-driven um, way. Dr. Yuni, I'm not trying to get you in trouble here with this next question. I really am not. But but I am curious about how this works because you're the director of the science advisory table and presumably you told the premier and his advisors, I'd like more data before we take the masks off. And presumably they said, well, that's very interesting, but we're going ahead anyway. Can you tell us how that conversation went? Well, actually the conversation didn't go that way. You know, what we uh, had, uh repeatedly is uh, exchanges between uh, Dr. Moore and, uh, and myself. And we have uh, quite a lot of uh, communication going on. Uh, a, lo a lot of that actually uh, also, you know, just the text messages that we exchange to compare notes. And uh, I haven't heard for a few days then uh, before this uh, decision was uh, communicated, basically, that the mask uh, mandates would be lifted. So uh, so the uh, the situation certainly was uh, that, that we agreed that we are in a stable part of this uh, lifting restrictions uh, because we didn't see test positivity go up. We didn't see um, wastewater concentration of, uh, of uh, viral RNA go up. This was good news. But uh, we are, were also aware, or I tried to make people aware of, that we are too early to tell uh, what's happening with the uh, last um, lifting step, which was uh, on March the 1st. So the point there is that a lot of that is a bit, you know, based on your uh, conditioning and your mentality. My mentality and my conditioning goes into, I want to have data first before I make a decision. And uh, um, what I what I just uh, noticed then, you know, and uh, I, I think that's a fair um, attitude as well. Um, Dr. Moore's attitude would be more like, look, the last reopening steps went well. We did this step wisely for every step, which is uh, documented that we're stable. And we believe that, you know, these uh, three week intervals that we have 
graph between steps or this one would be a three week interval would work out. So different mentalities here. Um, uh, you know, it, I'm, I'm not suggesting that they, they were wrong with uh, communicating or lifting, basically. We will see how it goes. The point is, we don't know yet whether we were wrong with doing that. No, I appreciate that. Honorable people can disagree about uh, whether it's today or next week or two weeks from down the road. I get that. But again, I'm just trying to figure out how it works. Do you actually advise the Premier and his people directly, or are you only advising Kieran Moore, the medical officer of health for the province, and then he deals with the premier. Oh, I think things have changed quite considerably now. And, uh, you know, uh, Adelstein Brown would need to basically just uh, contribute to this discussion as well. But you need to understand how it worked in the past was that the, uh, one of the core chairs of the science table and one of the core chairs uh, Dr. Beate Sander of the uh, modeling consensus table would typically um, brief the cabinet and uh, and we would also me also then being present we would uh, basically have discussions with the health coordination table this is something that has changed now you know because we're in a different part of the pandemic and we don't have these formalisms in place the same way anymore and uh, while i was just uh, together with uh, with uh, with uh, dr schwartz just uh, yesterday briefing uh, the minister of health this is uh, has become more of an exception now and the you know the systems of communications just have changed a bit which is not necessarily a bad thing we're in a different part of the pandemic and i think the you know the these uh, last uh, bits of decision making worked really well. Remember the Omicron wave? This was done relatively informally, but we actually just made it towards the right decisions there. Okay, thank you for indulging me on that. I am always curious as to how these things work out. Sabina, uh, okay, how do we get into this here? The masks are going to come off, and uh, for, you know, there's going to be widespread disagreement in society about whether or not this is a good idea or bad idea. Some people are going to show up to work without masks on. Other people are going to show up with masks on. Personal interactions going forward are going to be challenging, curious. I don't know what word you want to use here, but can you sort of envisage for us how you think all these, how, how's this all going to work out? You know, I think that when I'm looking at what what it's going to be next week once mass mandates are lifted, I think for me, my biggest concern really comes down to those who are immunocompromised. I get so many messages from those who are immunocompromised, um, feeling like they're being left out and left behind. Um, you know, I think that they're being left to their own devices to risk manage. They're also getting a lot of harassment for wearing masks um, by those who disagree with mask wearing. And I think that we need to be at a point where we respect everyone decision, knowing also that, you know, the immunocompromised especially are most protected when there is bi-directional masking in place. You know, I think we're going to get to a point where the, you know, people who are not immunocompromised are going to be able to do exactly what they were doing before, but now not wearing a mask, whereas those who are immunocompromised are going to be able to do even less um, than what they were, that they're able to do right now with, um, you know, mandatory masking in place. So I think in terms of interactions, we're going to see, uh, you know, a whole uh, spectrum of interactions here with some people having maybe improved or back to normal interactions, but others actually having far reduced interactions because they simply do not feel safe doing even basic things such as grocery shopping. So I think we really have to consider the equity aspect of this. Andre, what's your advice in terms of the literally millions upon millions of interactions that will happen after March 21st? Some masked, some not. Well, I'm in a jurisdiction where we haven't had, where we lift the mask mandate a week ago. And it's been interesting to see uh, who's wearing a mask, who isn't, how do you talk to each other? I haven't found a lot of hostility. I've had people say, oh, you don't have to wear a mask anymore. And I say, well, I choose to. And they say, okay, great. Uh, so I haven't seen a lot of that anger or uh, so I think that's what it's about. We have to respect each other as we don't necessarily agree. Should we be masked or not? We have to respect that. And uh, that's going to be interesting going forward. This in-between time where we're all trying to find our footing is going to be interesting. But I think, uh, you know, as Sabina said, it's about trying to respect people. That's why I do it, because I don't know who else is shopping in the grocery store. Uh, I tend to go early in the morning. It's a lot of older people. I'm going to wear my mask uh, just to be a good neighbor. So I think a lot of that is going to be uh, about personal responsibility. Responsibility. We hear the per the politicians talk about that that terminology, personal responsibility. But I don't think that uh, should 
uh, stop them from giving us guidance. Yes, personal responsibility is important, but it doesn't take away the need for guidance and, and public health rules. And I think that's where we've kind of uh, been a bit of a cop out on that uh, side. Can you just give me a, a quick follow up here? Andre, on uh, I think it was last Friday that the mask came off from British Columbia. What what was the uh, I mean overwhelming reaction if there was one among British Columbians to the mask mandate coming off this quickly? Hey, I think it was kind of a shrug. You know, people say new things were coming. Uh, I think there was much more discussion about uh, why are we keeping our vaccine passports? Uh, that one's uh, still in place. So I, I think that one's a much more uh, volatile one. A lot of people who don't have their vaccines want to go out. So it, it, it hasn't been a really you know, large reaction. It's just people said, oh, okay, well, I'm going to wear a mask or not. I'd say the majority of people still do mask in public places. Okay, Peter Uni, let's just understand again, back here in the province of Ontario, we have already seen at least one school board, the Hamilton Wentworth School Board in, um, in Southern Ontario, has pushed back. And they said, we actually think the students should keep their masks on. And the Minister of Education pushed back against them and said, well, you, you need the permission of the local medical officer of health if you want to do that. There are some companies, some businesses uh, who are going to want to continue to have mask wearing policies in the province, uh, even if the masks come off. Uh, how do you see all this unfolding? I think it will uh, unfold in a dynamic manner as previously. You know, what we've seen in Ontario was actually pretty remarkable. People reacted relatively swiftly to a change of situations. They decreased their contacts. They uh, became more careful. One of the reasons we actually sort of managed with the Omicron wave in Ontario, that was absolutely just people's behavior, even before we implemented public health measures. So what I trust now is that people continue to do their response dynamically, meaning they take it slow now. They uh, don't pretend they're Everything is over and uh, that we will see, you know, perhaps the similar reaction that we saw basically in a BC, what Andre just was, uh, was uh, referring to. Yeah, some of us will wear masks, others don't. If it comes to schools, to be honest, you know, I could have lived very easily with just waiting for two to three weeks. As Sabina also, also has said, you know, we're just after a March break. Do we really just want to make this step? I also see the challenges a bit more, you know, my two small ones are uh, eight and ten. They, you know, uh, I will discuss with them or already have, you know, that uh, that uh, I would like them, you know, to keep their masks on, etc. But there will be quite a lot of peer pressures and we don't know yet how this will all play out. So for schools, I think what have, would have been the right step probably is just to say two to three weeks longer. We see how it plays out, you know, in the other settings. And then we just take, you know, this uh, last step because schools are a high risk setting. Why? We have all these kids just being in the same classroom, you know, for six, seven or eight hours. That makes a difference, of course. Uh, okay, a bit of a chippy follow up here to you then, Dr. Uni, and that is you and Dr. Moore disagree on this. He's okay with the masks coming off on Monday and you think a little more time with the masks on would be good. I wonder whether you believe Dr. Moore is succumbing to political pressure from the current government of Ontario to get the masks off sooner. Oh, I don't have any evidence for that. We need to be very aware of that. What I can tell you is just what we see, all of us, you know, that's not rocket science, just to look at this uh, from an international perspective, or, but also, uh, you know, a Canadian perspective. There uh, is this increasing move towards lifting one restriction after the next, and it starts to backfire in Europe. Yeah, by the way, we see all these U-turns of cases. And, uh, and um, there is certainly a certain pressure just, you know, coming uh, just uh, from this international and national setting, but I don't have any evidence to suggest that Dr. Moore would be under pressure here. And uh, I made a statement, you know, uh, that co was was interpreted accordingly um, in uh, Metro Morning the other day or so. So just to clarify that, this may be entirely uh, Dr. Moore's decision. And I hope in the next few days or so, when the dust settled a bit, I have an opportunity to talk about this with Dr. Moore. Understood. Andre, start us off on this. You know, uh, you're in British Columbia. British Columbia is a big province. Ontario's even much bigger. COVID has not hit these two provinces in the same way. Uh, I know here, for example, in Northern Ontario, where you're from originally, or uh, on First Nations reserves around this province, uh, COVID has had and continues to have a disproportionate influence. Should we have made the decision to say masks can come off in some areas where the numbers warrant, but maybe masks should stay on in other areas 
where we really haven't got this completely under control yet. What's your take on that? I think it's a, actually a complex question about how do we manage uh, just the simplicity of messaging, like a single message I think is really important, but how do you adapt it locally? So I think uh, there's no proper answer to that is, yeah, maybe, ideally we should have little local rules, but they're hard to manage. So I think it's been easiest to have central provincial rules. Uh, and that's just simple. Uh, so I, I think, you know, I, in an ideal world, yeah, we adapt to every little local condition, to every bit of data, but that's not uh, practical and it's not realistic. Sabina, what do you think on that? You know, I think that one size fits all approach does not really work in pretty much every setting that we've looked at in the last two years. The one thing that we know that even if we're trying to simplify things or we're trying to, um, you know, make things equal, we know that backfires. The one size fits all has time and time again not worked. I think taking a more local, hyper local, targeted approach is always, always um, going to work in our favor. And I think over here as well, we should be taking a similar approach to the way the US and CDC have has done. We take it based on the region, based on metrics, and and uh, you know have these policies in place. Um, looking at what the data actually says. Dr. Yuni, should we have taken a more hyper local approach? I'm not sure. You know, it's it's it, this is less than black or white. I see the communication issue. It's much easier to say, okay, we still have a mandate. You know, a few more weeks, and uh, you know, it will uh, be very soon that we can lift it. Just not right now. But uh, what we see in wastewater, for example, is really that uh, the response now to the last reopening step may be a bit different. You know, in the GTA where things are still more okay than in other places of the province, would this mean that we probably should be a bit more more careful in these other places, perhaps we will see how it plays out. Well, we've mentioned Dr. Kieran Moore, the Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario a few times already, so it's probably only fair here that we let him speak for himself. And here's something he said the other day. He said, well, this does not signal that COVID-19 has disappeared or that the pandemic is over. It does mean that we have come to a place where we know what we need to do to manage this virus and to keep each other safe. He said that actually back on March the 9th. Sabina, you want to react to that? Do you think he's on the right page with that? I mean, we, we do know what we need to do to keep people safe. And I think masking is one of those things in our in our toolbox that actually works really, really effectively. But here we are still, um, I, I personally feel removing mask mandates, um, you know, where the science and the evidence simply, in my opinion, does not follow. I mean, we have two solid pieces of data that just came out from the US looking at um, masking in schools. And, and they compared schools that had partial uh, masking versus no masking versus mandatory masking. And there's a huge difference there in schools that had no masking or partial masking versus those that had mandatory masking. You know, 72% reduction in COVID cases. And again, I think we come back to the point over here that we have tools in our arsenal that we can use to try Try and make sure, um, you know, that uh, we're we're trying to limit the spread of, of the virus. We have to look at things like long COVID. What the impact of of long COVID is going to be? What the impact is going to be in children who are not yet vaccinated? Um, and I and yes, I agree. We do have tools. We're just not using them. Dr. Yuning, when you hear that comment from Dr. Kieran Moore, do you wonder whether he's following his own advice? <laughs> I think he is following his own advice. One thing which is really important is that the sequence is right. We lift mask mandates last. I agree with Sabina. As, I, as we said before, it's probably a bit too early. More data would be needed. And one other point which was really just brought up by Sabina is really important. We don't know yet how the risk of long COVID will be with the Omicron um, wave that we're seeing right now. Is Omicron resulting in a considerably lower risk of, uh, of uh, long COVID? Or uh, how does this look? It's it's simply too early to tell. So, you know, from, from, uh, from all of these perspectives, it just means we would want to avoid that we have a, a, a new wave coming because we just, uh, you know, too careless. I do not believe it will be a new wave. Why? Because of us as a population. We did the right thing before and we will react dynamically. But to be honest with you, if we do what my original home country, Switzerland, does, pretend everything goes back to normal, you know, wonderful, you know, there is uh, no masking needed. We, we, uh, we basically just meet everywhere 
contacts back to normal as before, uh, as as uh, if we were before the pandemic, this can backfire, and then we would just create a new wave, and we wouldn't like that. So the scenarios that I think about right now is we do that step wisely, we wait that the weather gets a bit better. Quite a lot of people, like Andre or so, as, as Sabina and myself, will continue to wear masks. Nobody bothers that we wear masks, and we see that you know in terms of mutual respect, we just want to move a bit further before we just lift everything. Well, let me follow up with Andre on that because, uh, and I'll set up the question this way, Andre, uh, America and Canada are very different places and we have heard multitudinous stories about the fact that people who wear masks in the United States often come under considerable opprobrium from those who think the mask mandates are ridiculous. And I wonder whether we might just be the opposite on that, that when next week comes and the people here who want to go mask less Maybe they will be in the crosshairs of those who think we ought to be keeping the masks on. You got any concerns about that? Well, I'm hopeful that I think Canadians overall are pretty mellow people, pretty respectful. And I think I, I wrote a column on this just the other day saying that's what we have to do, just to respect uh, each other's opinion. Uh, life is not a trucker convoy. I think most people out there are quite uh, decent with each other, uh, understanding. Uh, I was on an elevator the other day. I had a mask on. Someone got on. They started being very Canadian, apologizing profusely, so I don't have my mask. And I'm like, listen, we can all make our own choice. I, I think that's what we have to do in this this in-between period is just give each other some slack uh, on this and life goes on. That is a very Canadian anecdote, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, and which I'm sure many people listening and watching to us right now have also experienced themselves. Dr. Uni, um, you mentioned pretending is not a great strategy uh, just a moment ago. And I want to compare two countries here, not your original Switzerland, but uh, we've seen numbers from Denmark and South Korea. Denmark dropped the mask mandates. South Korea kept its mask mandates. South Korea's numbers don't seem to be any better than Denmark's. What are we to infer from that? So um, I, I think we, we really just have a bit of a different situation, you know, just in, the, in these two places. Um, I don't believe that you that you can compare it because the social situation is different, the background immunity is different, etc. And again, you know, as I said before, what you see in in uh, in places like Denmark or Switzerland just indicate you once you lift all the restrictions, you will experience a wave. Um, we won't start from scratch here because we have experienced an Omicron wave that we controlled relatively well. And what then happens if you lift all restrictions and go back to normal, you will need roughly, that's what we see in Iceland, in Denmark. And it probably also, you know, depending on the situation and the social circumstances, etc., could happen in other places too, that roughly about 45% of the population will need to get infected before um, a wave starts to peak and we start to see numbers go down. Now, if you just reach these 45% in an, you know, in, with an extreme peak, your way to go down is a long way. And what happens is that once you're down, you know, at the end of the wave, you have infected 90% of the population. We would like to avoid that and this won't happen in Ontario. Mm -hmm. Why? We already have roughly perhaps 25 to 30 percent of the population now infected and we just have to go probably another 15 percent or so of the population. Once these 15 percent are infected, we start to be not wobbly anymore, but relatively stable and continue to go down with our numbers. No? So you need to be really careful. The background immunity that we have, you know, in various places is different. It depends on the vaccination role out, but it also depends on how many people were actually infected. And when you look at Denmark, you know, they had a considerable delta wave already, which again helped with the background immunity of the population. Sadly so, but it's a fact. Okay. In our last five minutes here, let's look at next steps. And Sabina, maybe you could start us off on this. We are obviously, for a whole bunch of reasons, not testing now in as widespread or as deep a way as we did when this thing started, or frankly, for that matter, even uh, two or three months ago. You got any concerns about that as we start to take our masks off? 
You know, I, I, I have, I, we're at a point where we need to invest into our infrastructure, especially into testing infrastructure, because that is what's going to guide us in terms of what we're going to do in next steps. If we wait for hospitalization numbers, knowing that they're a lagging factor, you know, we, we're, it's going to be too late. We need to be proactive. We need to be using preventative measures. And the reason is because no one wants to go into another lockdown. I don't want another lockdown. You don't want another lockdown. No one wants a lockdown. And the way we can do that, the way we can actually prevent having lockdowns and other stringent me measures in place is by having things like masking and testing and some of the other infrastructures in place so that we don't actually get into more restrictions and in fact we're able to continue to loosen things as we go along. Um, so absolutely I think that we have to be investing into our infrastructure in the next coming weeks. Andre what's your view on that? We've really de-emphasized testing uh, a lot more more recently than we did say six months ago. Well, my concern is not, it's not just testing, it's what are the metrics when things go south again? You know, if numbers start spiking up, that's the problem. The fundamental problem with what's happening is I, I can live with restrictions being lifted. I, I think polit politics matter, that we have to respond to the public being fed up. That's all okay. But I don't like having an arbitrary date. Well, we're dropping an arbitrary date. So what's going to happen if things go bad again? Are we going to have an arbitrary date to bring back masking or or uh, vaccine passports, that's what's lacking in here is why did you do it? What's going to be the trigger to act again? That, that's my biggest concern. And testing is obviously a part of that. Uh, I don't think we have to do testing like we did in 2020. It's a different world, but we have to use our testing more smartly and we have to use it as a, a trigger for action, uh, whether it's positivity rate or whatever. We don't have to pay as much attention to cases, but we have to have measures, hospitalizations, positivity rate, and make them clear to the public. Like, here's what's going to happen if things go badly again. Yeah, Dr. Uni, the Premier has always said he's always been happy to be criticized for moving too slowly. He's always said, I don't mind being the most conservative, cautious political leader in North America, keeping the schools closed longer than everybody else, keeping the masks on longer than most. He's been content to be labeled that way. However, if we end up taking the masks off and things get bad again, how difficult do you think it's going to be to convince people to okay, we got to take some steps backwards here and put masks back on, ramp up the testing again, maybe lock down again. Uh, who's going to be, who's going to welcome that news? Um, okay, there, there were quite a lot of elements in there that I don't think will happen. One is the lockdowns. I don't think we will see, uh, again, restrictions at the same level as before. Why? We built up so much short-term immunity right now that the, if there would be a wave, this wave would not be as deep as before and would peak at a lower level than before, which is, you know, good news still. Then, you know, the other part uh, really is, I think, if the measures we're talking about would be go back to masks and, you know, re-intensify the rollout of third doses. I'm not a sociologist, but I would believe based on the previous, you know, uh, experiences I had with this, with this population here in Ontario, people would just say, okay, let's just get this done because we don't want to have uh, further restrictions, etc. So I think we should be okay. If it comes to, you know, testing, etc., what we need to be aware of, you know, a test, a, a PCR test, $40 per test. If you do 60,000 of those a day, that's 2.4 million uh, Canadian dollars every day here in Ontario. It's a lot of money that's not financially sustainable. We need surveillance systems. One we have already, that's wastewater. We need other surveillance systems that are based based on individuals, of course, and we need uh, just a careful monitoring of the situation in the hospitals too. Is this, you know, potentially as good as what we had before? The answer is yes, if we do it carefully. Wastewater, for example, gives you a much more reliable signal that doesn't depend on your testing strategy and behavior of people than uh, what we've had before. So we just need to use the tools we have wisely. And yes, things will change over time. If we test, we need to, what we need to do there is just to have a test uh, to treat strategy, and this will need to be brought to the communities. That will be really important. We see again and again, you know, that those people who are who are in, uh, in mo most marginalized communities are struggling most. Worse prognosis, still lower vaccination rate, and we need to bring treatments like Paxlovid to those people. And this only works if we test early enough and if we have a possibility to communicate to people, listen, 
you're at high risk, you would actually be able to get an antiviral like Paxlovid. Please get tested early. This will not be easy and we need to work on that during the summer. Understood. I want to thank the three of you for coming on to TVO tonight and so eloquently sharing your views. Andre Picard, Sabina Vora Miller, Dr. Peter Uni. Godspeed going forward, everybody, and thanks for showing up on TVO tonight. Thanks a lot. Year after year, the small northern country of Iceland rates tops in the world for gender equality. Eliza Reid is the first lady of Iceland, and while she is a true emissary for her country, as a Canadian expat, she's brought fresh eyes to understanding its success. She's now written a book that explains a good deal about how her adopted country does it. It's called Secrets of the Sprakar, Iceland's Extraordinary Women and How They Are Changing the World, and it brings Eliza Reid to our virtual studio from Washington, D.C., and it's a delight to meet you. I don't know if I, uh, you know, we, we talked just before going on the air about what I'm supposed to call you. I'm not going to call you by your first name because that just feels rude. But how about just hi and thanks for joining us. Is that okay? <laughs> that sounds terrific. Thanks okay. so much for inviting me. Not at all. It's great to have you here. First of all, Sprakar. That, that's a word none of us will know. What does that mean? Right. It's an old Icelandic word, also an obscure word, even if you happen to speak Icelandic. And it means outstanding women. And what I love about the word especially is the fact that it is grammatically a masculine word that is used to only describe women. And I can't think of any words in the English language that are used to describe women in a positive way. <laughs> Very good. Now, it is an unusual thing for a first lady of any country to write a book while she has that title. So uh, why do this and what made you think uh, this was a good idea? I, I think that's an excellent question, and I have a background in, in journalism and writing, and the pragmatic answer, I suppose, is that I had this idea for what I thought could be an interesting book right at the beginning of the pandemic, and I found myself with the time to be able to write it. But I also think, as you say, the fact that I am writing a book while I am serving as First Lady uh, says something about the state of gender equality in Iceland, that uh, I have the privilege and honor of serving in this voluntary, unofficial role as First Lady. And so, of course, I should also be able to pursue my own professional projects at the same time. And no one has given you a hard time over this? Nope, nope. Okay. You, this next question is so unfair because in a way it's like asking which of your kids do you love the most? But uh, <laughs> in order to give our viewers and listeners a sense of the kinds of people you've written about, can you pluck one out of the book and just tell us why you are so delighted and impressed, et cetera, et cetera, with this person? I uh, just one that leaps to mind right away, I guess. I'll talk about a, a farmer called Hava, who has a farm that is the size of the UK Channel Island of Guernsey. That's 24 kilometers from Iceland's most dangerous volcano. And not only is she working as a farmer and a sheep shearer, which are very male dominated roles, but she does it in this casual way. And I asked her if it concerned her that she was farming so near a volcano. And she said, well, if I spent all day thinking about that there might be an eruption tomorrow, I'd never get anything done today. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that sort of indicates a very practical uh, Icelandic, Icelandic streak. We did mention in the introduction that Iceland seems to be one of these countries in the world where it's actually great to be a woman, that the kinds of discrimination that you see in other countries, we don't want to say it doesn't exist, but it's much less in Iceland. Why do you think mm -hmm. that is? It's a lot of different things, and we are always very quick to say, of course, we're not perfect. We do have areas where we can improve. Uh, we have had a strong and long history of very independent, strong women. Uh, we have women at the moment in very visible positions of authority, for everyone from the prime minister to the bishop of the national church to the head of the national police service. And I think really as a society, we have moved past the tipping point of judging or debating whether trying to achieve gender equality is something important, but arguing maybe how we're going to get there. And we see on the indicators that gender societies that are more gender equal are more prosperous. The people who live there are more happier. They're longer living for everyone in the population, not just women. And because we've been working towards this for a while now, I think people in general are seeing how it's good for all of society. Well, you say you've been at it for a while. And in fact, I, I uh, learned a great deal in the chapter of your book about October 1975, Women's Day Off. You want to just tell everybody mm -hmm. what happened then? 
Yes, on the Women's Day off in 1975, 90% of the country's women decided not to go into work. And that meant both not showing up for their paying jobs, but also not doing any of the unpaid work that they were doing in the home. And predictably, the country shut down. So there weren't any flights because the flight attendants weren't at work and the banks were closed because the bank tellers weren't there. And my husband, uh, who was eight years old at the time, remembers it vividly because his father cooked supper and it was apparently awful. He he wrecked all the hot dogs, which actually sold out of the stores because that's what all the fathers tried to buy and prepare for their children. And it really galvanized the whole nation into showing that when people work together, you, you can really have a difference. And, and five years later, we'd elected a female president. And what long range impact do you think that event in 1975 actually had? It's still something that people talk about to this day. As I mentioned, then five years later, Iceland elected the first democratically elected female head of state in the world. And, and that was really a momentum that was initiated from that event. And even today, this initial day off was designed to talk about the wage inequality between men and women. And every few years, we still have well, days off or times off where women stop work at the time when they have been earning what men have earned. So every few years we have it, it ends maybe a few minutes later as we inch closer towards gender parity when it comes to equal pay. Hmm. Let me read something of yours in the book here. In many countries, the issue of gender equality is steeped in politics, affecting legislation that encompasses issues from health care to education. Here in Iceland, however, the debate is no longer whether gender equality is an important objective, but how best to achieve it. To paraphrase former American First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton, gender equality is a human rights issue, not a political one. I therefore do not see this book as espousing political views. I leave that to the politicians. I gather it was sort of important for you to put that on the record because you do have to tread a, a careful path in your role as first lady. You can't get too political. On the other hand, um, you don't want this book to be pablum either, right? Fair to say? Absolutely, absolutely. I hope that it's uh, an interesting and fun read, but, but smart and well-researched. But you're absolutely right, especially in Iceland, the role of the president is not a political one. My husband doesn't belong to a political party. I don't belong to a political party. So I absolutely don't want to be espousing partisan political views. But as I mentioned, I, I, I firmly believe that something like gender equality is a human rights issue. It's not an issue that is pitting one gender against another gender. It's not a, a zero-sum game. It's something that we are fighting for to create a more equitable fair and successful society for everyone. And I think that it's very important to speak up about these imp important issues if we have an opportunity to do so. I bet you Hillary Rodham Clinton gets asked every day of her life to offer a blurb, you know, one of those endorsements for the back cover of a book. And I'm betting she turns down 99.9% .9 of the people who ask her, but you got her. How did you do that? Well, I, I thought of Hillary Rodham Clinton because I admire her very much, and she is a former first lady, of course. And so I thought perhaps she might be intrigued by the fact that a serving first lady had written a book on, on an issue that I know she thinks is important. Uh, I, I also have an old friend from graduate school who had used to work with her a long time, and he was able to put me in touch with the right team members. And and um, and she got a chance to take a look at the book, and, and I was so uh, grateful and happy that she enjoyed reading it. Okay, back to Iceland being, well, how about this? World Economic Forum. They have a list of countries that are the closest to achieving gender equality, and Iceland has been number one. Canada is number 24. Now, uh, I imagine you want to tread lightly here, but, uh, you know, we are looking for advice wherever we could find it. What would you tell us we need to do that clearly we're not doing? That's right. I do need to tread a bit lightly, but I'll, I'll highlight maybe a few of the things that I think have been successful for us in Iceland. And people in Canada can and take, or take or leave what they will of that. Um, in terms of policies, absolutely, and I've spoken about this very often, I would say Iceland's uh, parental leave program, which is a use it or lose it system, which means that both parents uh, are allocated different amounts of parental leave is important. Also to encourage men to get involved in the children's upbringings from a very early age. There is also very affordable, heavily subsidized childcare, which results in the fact that Iceland has the largest participation of women in the workforce of all the OECD countries. We also, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, have a lot of visible role models. We have 47.5% members of parliament are women and, uh, and, and visible role models in other areas, such as, as I mentioned, the, the head of the, of the police service 
and, and people in different aspects of society. So I think the visible role models and, and uh, systems that enable everybody to be contributing as much as possible are absolutely very helpful. Now, we don't have targets or, or um, um, I'm not sure, regulations or anything like that that oblige uh, political parties in this country to have women representing X number of percentage mm -hmm. in parliament. And as a result, maybe, uh, here we are 154 years later and we're at 30 percent and you're nearly 50-50. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. you have laws that oblige um, women to hold certain roles in Parliament or anything like that? We do not, but we do have a party list system, which is much different than the first-past-the-post system. And within certain political parties, they maybe have their own rules that need to have women in uh, in, in sort of being at least 50 percent of the top number of seats. And so with this party list system, which means roughly proportional representation, so if your party gets 20 percent of the vote, you get 20 percent of the seats, uh, does make it a little bit easier to have gender equality in parliament. OK, here's where I sort of gently push back on you a bit here. Okay. You know the knock. You've heard this before. I mean, Iceland, for goodness sakes, has a population half the size of the city of Mississauga, and it's a much more homogeneous population uh, as well. So you guys can do this more easily in a way that the rest of the world can't. That's the argument. You want to push back on that? I'm, I'm happy to push back on that a little bit. Um, I think, you know, absolutely there is an advantage of being very small. It means that we also see the results of things very quickly. Um, and, and, and I'm not going to argue that there are disadvantages. I will push back more on the suggestion that Iceland is much more homogeneous. It's something that I emphasize a lot in the book. And perhaps the fact that I'm an immigrant myself is something that I want to showcase. Uh, Iceland has more people of foreign origin living in the country than senior citizens. It's over 15% of the population is foreign born uh, or holds a foreign passport, which means it doesn't include people like me who have citizenship and are born and raised elsewhere. Uh, that is a lower percentage than in Canada, but it's significantly higher than the percentage in the United States, for example. So Iceland is much more multicultural than people think. And, and I think that, you know, yes, we are small, but we do have a, a diversity of, of, of needs and, and viewpoints. We have people living in isolated areas in the countryside. We have people living in urban environments, uh, different levels of education and skill backgrounds and, and different levels of, of wealth and prosperity. So absolutely, we have some, some challenges too. But perhaps the biggest advantage of being small is the fact that we get to see those results maybe a little bit faster because I, I really believe that as we see uh, tangible results for moving in this direction, it will really help to build momentum. Okay, let's go back in time. I want to talk about the fact that the First Lady of Iceland is made in Canada. You grew up at a, you know, in a, I guess in a hobby farm in the Ottawa Valley. I won't say how many years ago, but I do, um, I'm kind of curious. What was your upbringing like? Um, my upbringing was was lovely. I, I was very fortunate. We moved. Yes, I, I we moved to this um, hobby farm uh, when I was ten years old, just outside of Ottawa. And uh, by hobby farm, I mean the fact that my my father's a teacher by professor, a, an English professor. My mom stayed at home, but they had sheep and chickens and ducks and various farm animals. And uh, it was it was a lovely place to grow up. And then I studied international relations at the University of Toronto, which uh, turned out to be a pretty good preparation for what I what I ended up doing and uh, moved to Oxford to go to graduate school and do a master's degree in history. And that is where I met my my Icelandic husband. And you obviously could not have imagined at that moment that this guy would eventually become president. You'd become first lady. I mean, your life has not turned out the way you planned. Is that safe to say? I think that's safe to say. I, so I don't know that I really had any kind of a plan, but if I'd imagined it, it, it was not this. But I'm, I'm so incredibly uh, grateful and feel so incredibly privileged. You are, though, living in a kind of a fishbowl that you otherwise wouldn't be living in if you did something sort of more along the lines of, of maybe what your original plans would have been. How <laughs> is that? It's very interesting and takes a bit of getting adjusted to. Um, I, I found it strange a little bit maybe to meet somebody out in the shopping center and someone would say, oh, you looked much younger in real life than you do on television or, or something like that. And that's it's a little bit strange to think that people ha have seen you and, and formed an opinion on you before they've even met you. But we're very fortunate in Iceland that that we do have quite a bit of, of personal freedom. And I'm very grateful for that. And 
it's also fortunate to be able to have the opportunity to uh, speak up about issues that I think that are important and and have people listen to them for the for the time being at least. There's a cute line in a New York Times piece about you where you were asked, what did you know about Iceland before you got there? And it was something like, um, well, I knew about as much as you know when you play Where in the World is Carmen San Diego. <laughs> now, I know you, yes. it's, you, you've improved since then, I know, but, but um, really? That, uh, let, let's face it, not, not much about Iceland is known by the rest of the world, not as much as maybe you'd like to know, but how mm -hmm. much did you know before moving there? I really knew, well, I mean, I guess I learned a bit more, but when I met my husband in 1998, that was before uh, the financial crash that brought attention. That was before this big tourism boom and direct flights from Canada. And so unless you were maybe a, a Canadian of Icelandic descent, I don't think that people knew all that much about the country. Um, I thought it was a similar size to the other Nordic countries and, and not smaller. But I did try quite quickly to learn a little bit, to learn more about it, to try to learn the language. And um, and and now I I love extolling the virtues of my adopted homeland when I'm traveling. Uh, I'm actually here in Washington to talk about a sort of promotion Iceland festival, and I'll be talking about literature and food and music and all kinds of fun things. So there there's a lot uh, to get to know about this country. Are you allowed to say who you're meeting later today? <laughs> I am. I th I think so. I'm. Uh, I have a an appointment with First Lady Jill Biden, and uh, I'm very excited to meet her. Going to compare some notes. Well, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you'll have to talk to me after <laughs> after the after the meeting. But probably what's said between First Lady stays between First Ladies. Oh, that's no fun. Oh well. <laughs> I would like to get your conclusions on. I mean, to the extent that that people know something about Iceland, it's that a lot of male bankers led your country into bankruptcy, and then a lot of female bankers got your country out of bankruptcy. And I wonder what lessons you drew from that. Well, that's a that's an excellent question. I think maybe a, a minor oversimplification. Part of that reason is that there were just a, quite a few more male bankers. Um, but I, I think the more we are going to see women in uh, decision-making roles, the more it's going to increase diversity, and the more diversity we have, the better solutions we have. I think a more relevant example now that we, I hope we see in the global situation is as peace talks uh, one hopes continue in the Ukraine, I would very much like to see women at the table there rather than uh, a bunch of men sitting around the table because we know that peace discussions are more effective and long lasting when they invite women. So I think it's just yet another example of the importance of diversity of all sorts for all kinds of organizations. Since you mentioned Ukraine, does Iceland have a role to play in this current tragedy that's unfolding in Eastern Europe? Well, Iceland is a founding member of NATO, even though we actually have no military. So like every other NATO country, we are, are shocked and, and horrified by what is going on. And I think like many other countries, the people in the country are, are donating to charities, are protesting outside the Russian embassy and are really doing what we can. And we have already accepted uh, Ukrainian refugees and will be accepting more and have sent Red Cross workers to the Polish border with the Ukraine and are doing as much as we can to su to support the Ukrainians in this situation. And just to be clear, your your husband's role is a mostly ceremonial role. He does not have decision making authority in the country, right? That, that, well, he has veto power over laws, but if you're talking about a situation such as Ukraine, he would not be the person deciding, uh, say, how much money to send or what priority to give. That's correct. Gotcha. You know, you're born in the second biggest country in the world, and now you live in one of the smallest countries in the world. And um, I just wonder if you ever feel isolated when you're in Iceland. No, I don't. You know, I think actually Canada and Iceland have very similar population densities. And, and there's a lot that characterizes the two of us. I mean, Iceland is small on the global stage. Iceland, uh, Canada is small by comparison to its massive neighbor to the south. We both have a, a little bit what I call in the book uh, sort of with fondness, small nation complex. You know, we're very excited if either Canada or Iceland are mentioned in the in the international news. And, you know, the world, we're just, we're all global citizens these days. It's so easy to travel and, and communicate and speak with each other. So I know I don't at all feel isolated being in Iceland now. And it's, it's not as far away as people think either. Uh, really? Yes, it's closer than, uh, closer to fly from Toronto to Reykjavik than from Toronto to Vancouver. Oh, okay. Well, when you put it that way, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. um, do I have this right? You got four kids? I do have four kids and a stepdaughter, yes. And do any of them look like they are interested in following in any footsteps into politics? 
Well, I think the priority really is the NBA or the uh, European Soccer League for my <laughs> son. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens later on. I, they're all, I have three sons and a daughter. They're all very, very much into soccer right now. So uh, we'll see if the professional uh, sporting careers don't work out, what, what next is on the list. So if they don't become World Cup champions, then maybe they might take a look at going into politics. We'll see, yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay, understood. Do you, this may be a, a, a difference without a distinction, but do you see yourself as a Canadian Icelandic or an Icelandic Canadian? That's an excellent question, and I'm just very pragmatic about the answer. Uh, I, it depends on the situation. Probably as a Canadian Icelander. You can hear when I speak that I have my Canadian accent. Um, I, I think what, what, what's been very fortunate about it all is that our, our two countries don't uh, meet very often in important sporting events. So my loyalties haven't been extremely tested thus far. Um, <laughs> But uh, I, I'm very proud to be Canadian. I'm very proud to be Icelandic. But if you say you're a Canadian Icelander, that means, mm -hmm. that means your Canadianness modifies what you are. And what you are is an Icelander. Is that right? Well, I've lived, I left Canada when I was 22 years old. Hmm. So I have, and now I'm a little older than 22 years old. So <laughs> I, I've, I've now lived a, a large part of my life, my adult life in, in Europe, mostly in Iceland. And, and so to me, that, that has shaped a lot of who I am. And of course, my children are all born in Iceland. But one's upbringing, I think, is, is so important. You know, I was, I was there cheering on our, our, our women's soccer team at the Olympics last summer, like everybody in Canada was. So I, I feel like I can wear both hats. Okay. In our last minute here, uh, since you point out that Toronto is actually closer to Reykjavik than it is to Vancouver, if people go to Iceland, mm -hmm. What's one thing they've got to do if they go? They have to go to an outdoor geothermal swimming pool, which is the most authentic experience. Uh, they're very warm. You can go year round. Uh, very, very clean. Great way to meet locals, get some fresh air. You don't have to really swim. You can just sit in a hot tub, and I highly recommend it. That sounds very cool. I, I'm a lot older than you, though, and I well remember Fisher versus Spassky in Reykjavik. And yes. I remember Reagan and Gorbachev meeting in Reykjavik as well. And I'm wondering, for us history nerds, are there some plaques around where those things happened? It's very interesting you say that. Absolutely. The chessboard that was played is at the Hotel Natura near the local mm. airport. And uh, they have uh, local city tours stop as well, of course, at the... Um, at Hovde House, which is the house where Reagan and Gorbachev met. And it's not always uh, open to the public, but we still at Besistada, the presidential residence, have the gifts that were presented uh, by Reagan and Gorbachev when they when they arrived in Iceland. So if, if, uh, if you were ever there when there was an open house or something, people could see those gifts as well. Awesome. We are happy to remind people that you are the author of Secrets of the Sprakar, and we are delighted that it has brought Eliza Reid, the First Lady of Iceland, to our virtual studio from Washington, D.C. It's been great to meet you and chat with you. All good wishes going forward and good luck. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me, Steve. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, March 16th, 2022. Tomorrow, epidemiologist Dan Werb takes us through why COVID-19 is both new and not new and why that matters in our reaction to the coronavirus today. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.